Okay, so this is the new chapter, chapter two, which is all about fiber characteristics. Um, when we talk about fiber characteristics, we'll talk about um, all the different um, properties that are really important about the fiber um, once it's been made into yarn and then eventually into the fabric. Um, it can be altered um, by such factors as yarn type, construction, and finish. Essentially meaning that the characteristics that are really important can be changed from what they are naturally. Um, so if we think about something like cotton fiber, um, cotton's a natural fiber. It grows on a plant. Um, it contains certain characteristics natural to it, um, but we can alter those so that they can become more suitable for the um, end product. So we'll kind of talk about that, how we can alter that um, in different ways. Um, help produce fabric and uses that meet consumers' expectations. So again, we choose a fiber for its end use based off of the characteristics that are natural to it, and then we can alter them or enhance them or just better adapt that fiber in certain ways to meet the expectations. Um, fibers are the building blocks of the end product. Um, that is something that um, it's essentially like the the basic Lego piece, the one by one Lego piece um, to the Lego that you're building. Um, fibers are the very, very, very tiniest little component that make up fabric or textiles. Um, so very important to know that, that fibers are just the starting point. Um, all fibers have assets and drawbacks. They all have pros, they all have cons. No fiber is perfect. And you'll learn that um, when you learn about all the different types. Um, fibers, what are they? So fibers are very fine, individual hair-like structures. Um, again, I love to use the idea of cotton because most of us know what cotton is. Most of us have seen at least a cotton ball. Um, and cotton is, um, again, one of the most widely used fibers um, in the textile industry. And if you can imagine holding a cotton ball in your hand and pulling off a single little thread or a single little hair, or what's actually called a fiber. So we're moving one fiber from that ball. Um, it's a pretty tiny little, you know, strand. It looks like a piece of fuzz. Um, so they're again, very fine, very small, very hair-like. Um, fibers are usually grouped together and twisted into yarns, but not always. Fibers can also be made directly into fabric. So we'll talk about something like felt later. And if any of you have used craft felt in the past, you know that craft felt cuts really easily. You can actually tear it, kind of like paper. So sometimes fibers skip the yarn stage and go straight to fabric. Um, fiber sources. So fibers come from a, a bunch of different sources. Um, they come from natural sources, and then they can come from chemical sources. So when we say a natural source, we mean that it's found in nature. Um, and we mean that it's found in nature essentially the way that we use it. So it can be either plant-based, which we call a cellulose, animal-based, which we call a protein, or mineral-based, which would be something like lame or asbestos. Those are um, both examples that uh, we, you know, use regularly or did use regularly at least, um, that were made out of minerals. So some examples of cellulose, and we'll talk more about the word cellulose. We'll talk more about these um, in the next slide. Um, but examples of cellulose would be cotton, linen, which is made from the flax plant, hemp, bamboo, which is actually a natural synthetic. We'll talk about that in detail in a little bit. Um, Ramey and jute. An example of protein would be wool, alpaca, silk, cashmere, mohair, and agora. Those are all types of animal um, coats or animal fur or animal hair. Um, and then there's another category, the manufacture of what we call the man-made from chemicals. Um, these fibers are essentially made from a solution that is made by man. There is a portion of the solution that does come from a natural source, but because it's been so manipulated and it's essentially just made from a chemical at this point, um, we, we consider these manufactured or man-made fibers. Now they come from what's called a spinneret. It looks like a shower head. Um, and chemicals are forced through the shower head and are hardened into continuous strands of what we call filament fibers. Again, we'll talk about all of these things in great detail as we go through this chapter and the next. 
Um, a filament fiber is a very long, continuous strand, essentially of never-ending, um, uh, never-ending um, fiber or filament. Um, we copied this idea from the silkworm. So we'll talk about the silkworm a lot in detail too. Um, the silkworm extrudes silk filaments that harden on contact with the air, and that's how it makes its cocoon. So we'll talk about the whole process and the history of the silkworm and how we kind of stole the idea from the silkworm on how to make manufactured fibers. Here's just the visual and natural fibers. So you see some natural fibers um, can come from, here's a little a sheep down there at the bottom. The image on the bottom right is actually a silkworm. So there's an image of a silkworm there eating. Um, the different, uh, the, the image on the bottom left, that's a, that's a cotton bowl. So it's not a cotton ball, but it's a cotton bowl. It actually comes from the plant just like that. A beautiful puffy little you know, ball of fibers. And then you can see up top, the two images at the top of the page, those are just um, kind of chunks of fibers that are being twisted into yarns. Okay, but you can see how very hair-like, um, and you know, <clears throat> we we see it as a a very fine fine material. Now, for manufactured fibers, those are a little bit different. Um, those ones are created in a very synthetic way. That shower head, that spinneret that we're talking about, it's in the top right-hand corner. So you can see it kind of looks like a shower head, and it's extruding these very, very, very fine fibers. They're super long. We call those a filament fiber. Um, and then you can see that most of the time when it comes to manufactured fibers, they go directly into the spinning process. So they get kind of twisted into a yarn, and they go directly onto either something called a bobbin or a spool, and then the yarn is kind of instantaneous. Different from the way that we make yarn um, when it happens in a natural form. So we'll talk about those. So this process, this kind of directly from spinneret to a yarn is important. Um, there's a couple of different processes. There's three methods. Um, there's the dry spinning, well, wet spinning, and melt spinning. So these are the three different methods used to harden manufactured fibers that are, you know, dependent on chem chemicals that are used within them. Um, and just get, again, depending on which kind of chemical, you can either dry spin it, wet spin it, or melt spin it. And again, this is because when we are making fibers, when we're doing it manufactured, we are going to just do it the really fast and easy way. We're going to go straight from fiber directly to yarn. Um, it would be very, very messy if you were to, uh, you know, kind of go to, uh, oh, I don't know, we call it roving. But if you were to take, if you were to extrude manufactured fibers, and if you were to then try to organize them in a way before you make them into yarn, it would get very messy, um, very tangled. So again, we just go straight to this method of we force it through warm air, we force it through liquid, or we melt a chemical and then force it through cool air to create these fibers and then directly make them into yarns. Now, if you, if you click on this video here, um, let me see if I can get this to go while I'm in screen record. Let's see if it'll let me. Okay, sorry, let me make this smaller. There we go. Let's see. I know you only see a portion of this. Sorry about that. So I'm just going to let this kind of play for a second. It's a good video. You have this attachment in your bag. Um, just, you know, These are solid polymers, so these are solid manufactured fibers. I'm going to go ahead and mute it because you don't want to need the techno music over it. Um, but these are solid fibers that are being poured into um, kind of like a little heating element. And then you'll kind of see a bunch of buttons are hit. And then eventually you'll watch the filament fibers start to pour out. Yep, see they're starting to drip out of that spinneret. Kind of messy at first. And they're all getting ready. And they're extruding. They're going to let it run um, until they're nice and clean and kind of perfect. There's a little bit of waste that happens at the beginning of the, the filament fiber production. And then you'll see that, oh, well that is a mess. So if we were to extrude and not make it into yarn, 
it would be very, very, very messy. So you can see that now that a, you know, a decent amount of the fiber has come out and it's nice and clean and organized, now it's going to be set up so that it can be made directly into a yarn. Tension is needed, needs to be wrapped around um, you know, the different components of the machine, and then you'll see how it's now being spun. It's being extruded and spun directly into a yarn. And then watch as it's being placed on the different, you know, winding devices. And then eventually it'll go down to the bobbin. And then there you go. Now the yarn can be created. Pardon my son's uh, YouTube favorites back here. Okay, so let's go back to that idea of fibers. Okay, so you were able to see how manufactured fibers are made, and now we're going to talk a little bit more about um, the fiber itself. And that spinneret video is great because you can see how, again, it's it's kind of being forced and falling out of that um, shower head. Um, so uh, when it comes to manufactured fibers. Um, we can control that. So we can control uh, the actual structure of the fiber because we can control the, the shape and the size of the spinneret that it comes out of. So fiber structure is really important because it's determined by its physical attributes. Um, again, natural fibers come that way in nature. We can't control the shape that cotton grows. Um, we can't control, you know, the, the shape or the, the length or the surface of the hair that grows on the sheet. That's all natural. Now, when it comes to manufactured fibers, we can determine the number of holes in the spinneret. We can change the shape of the holes, and we can change the size. Um, but again, this is all different for all types of fibers. So natural fibers come a bunch of different ways. And all of that, again, happens in nature. The length, the shape, and the surface is what we will focus on. Um, because again, these are really, really important to how the fiber works. So fiber length, um, it can vary. It can be less than one inch to miles long. So we break up fibers based off of the length. We call certain fibers staple fibers, and then we call other fibers filament fibers. Now staple fibers are the shorter fibers. They're measured in inches. I like to think of a staple fiber like the size of a staple, not very big. Um, you could fit a staple in your hand, whether that be a big staple or a little staple. So staple fibers are small, measured in inches. Something like cotton would be measured in staple fiber length um, because cotton usually are longer than an inch, maybe an inch and a half. Filament fibers are fibers of really long length, of longer lengths. Um, silk is the only natural fiber found in filament form. And again, we'll talk about this more. Remember, we stole the idea from the silkworm on how to make manufactured fibers. Um, so it's actually, on average, 1,600 yards. So we're looking at 3,500 feet um, for one silkworm, um, which is it's just wild and amazing that it can do that in nature. Um, so again, we took that idea, and now we manufacture uh, man-made fibers in the same way. So keep that in mind. Remember, you know, as early on as you can, silk is the only natural fiber found in filament form. Now, if you look at the bottom pictures, you can see that staple fibers are essentially like a bunch of uh, pieces of spaghetti that have been broken. You know, um, in my household, we eat a, a soup called fideo, and it looks like little spaghetti noodles that have been cut really short. Um, that's kind of this idea here with the staple fibers. They're really short, really small little um, fibers. Where filament fibers are the long spaghetti noodle. Um, you know, everything's intact. It's really long. Um, and so I'm going to kind of keep that in mind. 
the two the two different lengths really important to how they work um, later on as a textile okay then the fiber shape the shape of the fiber can differ greatly so there's a there's a figure in your book I just took a little tiny snippet of you know one of the pictures from the book but there's a um, an actual um, like a table in the book and it's got a bunch of different examples um, so microscopically all fibers are shaped very very differently um, if you were to take a straw and if you were to look at it um, into the hole so if you were to hold a straw and look down into it you would tell that the straw is usually a circle um, with a circle hole on the inside that's how we're able to suck the water through it um, not always though you think about it sometimes they're smashed straws you know where they're more flat um, you can have a heart-shaped straw I guess um, but we're talking about looking into the hole, looking into the opening. This is what we're talking about when we talk about the fiber shape. We're talking about looking down into a cut piece of fiber, like the pictures below. Now this is what determines the fabric's bulk, texture, luster, and hand. Um, when we talk about bulk, we talk about the fact that if you have a really round fiber that's just like perfectly round, um, all the fibers are the same. They're all going to sit pretty close to each other with no air. Like there's not going to be a lot of space in between. But if you take a bunch of the fibers that look like the serrated fiber on the left here, and you set them next to each other, because they're very, very differently shaped, and because there's a bunch of pokey ends, and they're not all symmetrical, when you go to sit those on top of each other, they're not all going to sit perfectly within each other's little grooves. They're not going to lay nice and flat. They're going to kind of be all over the place. And so what's going to end up happening is that space is going to form between the fibers as they sit next to each other. Air is going to be in there, so it's going to cause something different. It's going to be different than a bunch of round fibers sitting perfectly on top of each other with no space in between versus, you know, having this irregular shaped serrated fiber sitting next to a bunch of its buddies where you're going to have air. It's going to be it's going to be more spread out, so it's going to be bigger and bulkier, but not necessarily warmer because there's going to be airflow. So again, um, just the shape of this fiber really determines a lot about the end product. Um, wool has a round shape naturally, um, results in a bulky fiber because not only is it round, but it's also scaly. So we'll talk about the outside, the exterior of that fiber in a little bit. Um, but being, being round um, really gives it a lot of warmth because if you look at that round fiber, there's no hollow core within it. Um, there's nothing cut out of it. So it's very solid. So it's going to make it very, very warm. And if you think about wool, we use it in coats, we use it in the, in the winter, in the fall. Um, it's because it does contain a lot of warmth. Um, olefin. Olefin is a fiber we'll talk about a little bit later when we get to manufactured fibers. Um, it's a newer manufactured fiber. It has an irregular shape, so you just can't kind of put your finger on it. And it's always a little bit different. Um, and this causes poor luster, but it's really good for hiding stains. So we'll talk about luster a little bit later on, but uh, I like to think about you got a metal a metal rod, you got a metal tube, okay? I don't know, you're you're putting in electrical, or maybe you're doing some type of plumbing, but you need to, you know, I don't know, you need a joint. So if you got a metal tube for electrical, it's a really sunny day, you set the tube outside because you need to cut it, and it is just reflecting the sun all over your face because it's a shiny metal tube. Um, lots of reflections, it's bouncing off and it's blinding you because it's so shiny. Now you take an, a tube uh, that is, oh, I don't know, let's say it's serrated shape like this, so it's just kind of got all these weird, funky little pokey, you know, parts, or it's really irregular shaped. You put that in the sun, still made out of metal. It's not going to reflect like that round, perfectly, you know, flat tube, because there's not a whole lot of single surface for the sun to reflect off of. The sun is reflecting off of a bunch of different surfaces. And so, again, that is what we would consider luster. When light reflects off and bounces back and gives you some shine, that's luster. And a very round or a very um, smooth surface will give you a lot of luster, but something that's irregular shape is going to have bad luster. But because of that irregular shape, stains can kind of go into those irregular surfaces and then they can be hidden. So, again, every fiber has pros and cons. Now the surface of a fiber, this is the outside, so this is um, the tube of the fiber. So I'm going to skip ahead just for a second so you can see this slide. If you look at the images on the left, those are the images of the, of the surface. And if you look at the images on the right, that's that cut fiber shape. 
So again, if you take the fiber, cut it in half, look at it under a microscope, and kind of look into it like it was a, uh, like a straw or a Twizzler. So I'm going to use an example of Twizzlers and red vines and straws a lot. Um, extension cords, just kind of get you to understand that idea of, um, you know, these long um, fiber slash yarn type of um, items. So the surface, again, there's another figure in your book. Um, there's a whole other um, page on all the pretty pictures. There's a scan of a, um, sorry that it's black and white, um, and that's a scan from the text. Um, the newer books have colored ones, and um, there's a lot of different examples of surfaces. So fiber, fiber surface can affect properties such as the hand, which is, means how it feels, um, the luster, how shiny it is, and the wicking ability, meaning um, how easily it can move water around. Now, we call this, we call the fiber surface, um, we call um, the way that we look at the fiber surface, the longitudinal configuration. Really what that means is like the length of the fiber. So taking the fiber and looking at it as a whole, um, as a length. So if you think about something like a worm, if you look at a worm, don't cut the worm in half, look at the inside of the worm. Just take the worm, lay it down, and then look at the outside of the worm. It's kind of ribbed, it's gooey, um, it's still really round, but you know, you know, worms have, because they can kind of accordion in and out, they have those little ribs all over their body. So we're, thinking, we're talking about that. We're talking about the exterior, the outside of it. So this is where I like to think about red vines and Twizzlers. So sometimes they can be straight like a straw. Sometimes they can be twisted like a Twizzler. Uh, coiled or crimped, like if you were going to coil or crimp your hair. Curled like your hair. You can think about a curling iron, curling your hair. Um, crimping is inherent in wool. So sheep just naturally have crimped hair. Um, so it makes it a little bit coarser. It definitely makes it feel kind of itchy because it's got those, you know, really sharp crimps. I don't know if anybody, you know, was alive in the 80s and if you ever used a crimper on your hair, um, very popular. Um, but it gave your hair a very zigzaggy, um, but a very pointed curl. It wasn't even a curl. It was more of like a, like a zigzag. So um, crimping causes um, these like serrations essentially in the shape of your hair. Um, so it's it just kind of naturally uh, sharp. Um, and so when you think about wearing wool, if something is made out of wool, a lot of times we say, oh no, I don't want to wear it. It's going to be really itchy. And again, it's just because wool naturally is shaped with a crimp to it. Not, not, not the most comfortable um, naturally. Uh, but it affects the resiliency, elasticity, and abrasion resistance. Um, and so it, it, you know, it, it, it causes a bunch of pros and cons to the end product. So longitudinal configuration or that length of the fiber, looking at the exterior of that long rod or that short rod, um, it affects a lot of different things. Okay, I'm going to go back to this. You can see here are some examples. The left side, so the left column is acetate, where the right side at the top is lyocell, cotton polyester, cotton silk, flax and silk, nylon wool, and then nylon. Now, again, um, they're not exactly the same. If you look at the cotton and the cotton, the one on top of each other, one, you know, on top of each other there, they don't look exactly the same because not all cotton is exactly the same. If you look at the two silks, um, those are sitting on top of each other in the third row down. Um, and then on the right column, those silks definitely don't look the same. One of them is a Tessa silk, and then one of them is um, what I would assume is a cultivated silk because it's so perfect. And they look wildly different. So again, things found in nature tend to look a little bit different. Now, if you look at the nylons on the left bottom, um, those also look different. But again, when it comes to manufactured fibers, we can alter them kind of to whatever we want, which is wonderful. Okay. Now the diameter of the fiber. This is really important. Um, and again, when you think about the diameter of something, you're going to think about um, how, how big it is. Um, like, uh, again, if you look kind of down into the straw, if you take an extension cord and if you are to kind of hold up a really skinny extension cord to a really fat thick extension cord and you, the diameter is going to be different. Um, the larger one's going to be a big diameter and then the smaller one's going to have a smaller diameter, the amount of space that goes around it. 
Um, so the diameter of a fiber really does affect the end product. Thicker fibers result in a stiff, rough, but wrinkle resistant fabric. Um, large diameter fibers result in a bulky fabric. Again, think about piling a handful of really thick extension cords into one hand and then piling a handful of just regular old normal diameter, you know, pretty small extension cords in your other hand. The, your one hand's going to be real bulky with the big ones and your other hand's just going to be, you know, normal. Fine diameter fibers result in sheer, lightweight, soft, and drapeable fabrics. So again, just the size, the thickness essentially, of that fiber makes a big difference to the end product. Now we um, classify fibers many different ways. We've already classified fibers into two different groups if you think about just the very first or second slide. Um, we separate fibers from natural, that's one group, and then we put them into manufactured, that's another group. Now we really get even more specific as we study textiles. Um, we kind of talked about this in chapter one. We're going to get down to the nitty gritty of every single aspect of the basics of textiles. We're not going to get crazy into the details, but we are going to get crazy into the basics. So fiber classifications. Fibers are classified according to their chemical makeup. Cotton and flax are classified together because they're both natural and they both are made up of what's called a cellulose. Um, they're cellulosic, meaning that they come from a plant base cotton, wool, polyester, these are all natural, but they're in different categories because cotton comes from a cellulose, wool comes from a protein or an animal, and polyester is synthetic or manufactured. Okay, so we're really going to break these down. Um, we're going to break down every little last bit about fibers. Now chemical composition means a fiber's chemical composition as it relates to reaction to certain things like bleach, sunlight, moths, flames. So we care about that chemical composition because it's going to make a big difference to the end product. If something, um, if a fiber does not react well to something like chlorine, um, we don't want to use it for a swimsuit. If it also doesn't react well to something like sunset, sunlight, we don't want to use it for a swimsuit. So we got to think of these things. We need to know all this information about the fiber before we choose it for the end product. It might look great for a swimsuit. It might feel great for a swimsuit, but we can't use it if it's going to deteriorate upon contact with chlorine or if it's going to completely lose color on contact with sunlight. So the molecular arrangement essentially means that just the way that the molecules are arranged within the fiber itself. Um, you don't need to know too much about like the nitty-gritty of the deep science of this, but you know all of this helps to kind of understand or comprehend um, you know the ability for that fiber to work for the end product. So the molecular arrangement meaning how close or far apart the molecules sit within the fiber. It affects strength, abrasion resistance, and resiliency. And if you just think about it, if the molecules are sitting really close together um, with a little bit of you know space between, it's going to be pretty strong and they have a strong bond. Um, it's going to help with abrasion resistance if they're really close together because there's not a lot of molecules sitting at the surface that are you know farther away and they have the ability to be rubbed off. Um, resiliency just meaning how long does it last, how well does it bounce back. Um, again, all these things are based off of the molecular arrangement, how those molecules are sitting naturally within the fiber. Now, natural fibers, we have little modification possible. We can't really, we can't really change the way that the, that the cotton molecules sit next to each other, the cellulosic molecules. With manufactured fibers, we can modify pretty much, you know, to a certain extent. So modification is possible. Okay. Uh, fiber performance properties. So this is really important. This is something that we really, really look at. Um, again, because this is super important to the consumer. So commercially important for the end use. When fiber possesses certain desirable physical, chemical, and molecular properties, um, we want to use it for certain things. Um, all fibers possess certain basic characteristics, which help determine whether they're suitable for a specific purpose. So again, certain fibers just do not work with sunlight. So we would not want to use that fiber for a swimsuit or for an outdoor hat or for an umbrella or for the fabric that you're going to use on your awning outside. There are certain things that we would not want to use. There are certain things that naturally hold up really well to sunlight. So, hey, maybe we'll use that for outdoor use. Okay, so you got to keep those things in mind. Um, performance properties, they're just kind of built in. Pros and cons to everything. 
um, the categories of the fibrous performance, we break down. Again, we just keep on breaking down these fibers into smaller and smaller um, categories. So we're going to talk about aesthetics, so the way that a fiber looks and feels, so you know, visual and tactile effects. We're going to talk about durability, so resistance to wear, how well it holds up. We're going to talk about comfort, how good does it feel, that physical comfort. Safety, the risk of um, injury or danger. And we're going to talk about how we test this. So there are standardized tests and laboratory procedures that are used to measure and compare fiber properties. Um, these are these are um, laboratories that are found all over the world, um, and this is where scientists work, or people who work in you know the textile production or um, textile testing or lab testing um, facilities. This is a, this is a very science-based job or career to get into. But again, I talk about this in chapter one. If you are someone who really likes science, in particular um, chemistry, um, this would be you know a really great career option for you because it really does you know meld the two um, fashion textiles and science together. Uh, so yes, we'll talk a little bit more about standardized testing later on. So we're going to talk about the first category: aesthetics, how it looks and feels. So I'm just going to break them down very very quickly because there are quite a few. Um, what we would consider aesthetics, um, flexibility, the ability to bend easily without breaking. The hand is how it feels when it's handled, so imagine in your hand. It's a soft, crisp, dry, silky, itchy. Luster, luster is how light reflects from a surface. Um, pilling, pilling is not a good thing, it's short or broken fibers that form balls on the surface. Uh, maybe you have a sweater that has pills all over it and you have to take your little razor, your little buzzer, and you have to kind of you know, shave off those little, those little pills. Um, resiliency. Resiliency is the ability to spring back after it's been creased, twisted, or distorted. Sometimes fibers won't. Sometimes textiles won't bounce back. Sometimes after, I mean, you could steam those curtains for five hours and they're still going to have those creases because they were shipped to you in a package. Um, so resiliency is very important. Specific gravity, this is the one and only time I'll talk about it in this class, but a lightweight fiber is able to be warm, thick, and lofty at the same time based off of specific gravity because, again, <clears throat> we can, you know, we can determine the end use for something, you know, depending on those characteristics. Static electricity, that's something that is important. That's something that we'll talk about um, when it comes to safety. So frictional electricity, electrical charges caused by rubbing together of two dissimilar materials. So that positive and that negative, once they are, you know, once they, you know, have that friction, uh, it builds up this electricity, and you can have where you have that little shock. Um, <clears throat> um, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. Um, I like to use the example of when you're a kid. Well, maybe not anymore because they changed this probably in the '90s. Um, but when we were kids in the '80s, you could run around the house with your socks on. And you would slip and slide and on purpose. You'd, you'd shuffle your feet really fast. And you would um, run up to your sibling and you could shock them. <clears throat> Excuse me, because fibers that you know, were used in rugs or uh, floor coverings before used to be um, really high in static electricity. Um, we, we realized that, <clears throat> me, which is not safe. Sorry, I'm going to take a drink. Sorry, <clears throat> do you realize that <clears throat> having this friction or this ability to cause an electrical charge is not good for um, floor coverings? So that's changed, so you can't really do that anymore. <clears throat> you can't really run around your house and shock your siblings. <clears throat> Sorry. Um, um, eptropic fibers, fibers that conduct electricity due to carbon or metal contact, they don't have um, static problems. So. These are things that we can you know, utilize. We can take those pros and those cons of certain types of fibers and utilize them in different ways. Sorry about that. I choked on my coffee and then choked myself. Um, thermoplasticity. This is super important. This is something that we will talk about um, many times when it comes to manufactured fibers. So how fibers withstand heat exposure. Thermoplastic fibers have the ability to be melted. So we'll talk about which fibers are thermoplastic and which ones are not. Um, but you might want this in certain fibers. You might want this in certain end uses. Um, so being able to, to melt or shape a fabric or a fiber, um, that's important sometimes. 
Now when it comes to durability, resisting the sign of wear, we break this down into different categories as well. So abrasion resistance, ability to resist wear from rubbing, super important, especially in something like workout wear or the material that you're going to use to upholster your couch needs to be very abrasion resistant. You don't want a big hole where people sit all the time. Um, you don't want a hole in your pants after working out or running at the gym. Um, chemical effects, the ability to resist wear through dyeing, finishing, and home care. Because when you think about just washing your clothes, you're taking a chemical wash of detergent, you're throwing it into the washing machine, and you're rubbing it all over your clothing. If something, if a textile doesn't hold up well to chemicals, you know, it could start to fall apart. Hence those, those, those tags with the laundry and instructions. Do not wash. Dry clean only. Um, environmental conditions. How fibers resist to exposure from insects, sunlight, mildew, etc. Um, there are just natural chemicals within the air. You know, those are environmental conditions that you need to be aware of. Strength. Durability. Strength. You know, those go hand in hand. The ability to withstand stress. The force needed to break the fiber. So strength is really important. That gets tested in the laboratory um, with different types of strength tests that we'll talk about a little later. Comfort, physical comfort. Okay, so absorbency. This is one that's really important. We don't think about, um, you know, we, absorbency necessarily as a physical thing, but it definitely, definitely is on the way that it feels. Um, so absorbency, the ability to take in moisture. Um, if something does not have good absorbency, that means that essentially whatever moisture either is on top of it or underneath it is just going to sit there. So if you think of something that doesn't have good absorbency, like a manufactured fiber, like polyester, not absorbent. If you think about that, if you think about it, okay, that's good for certain things. But if you're wearing a polyester, let's say long sleeve dress in the summertime, and you're standing in the sun, you're going to get hot and sweaty because it doesn't breathe very well. And then you're going to sweat. And then the fabric is not going to absorb your sweat, so you're going to be sitting in sweat, which is not a good thing. So, sorry. Um... You know, all very, very, very important things to think about when you're making an end product. So we're going to talk about two very, very, very important words. We're going to talk about the word hydrophilic, and then we're going to talk about the word hydrophobic. Okay, sorry, bounce back. Hydrophilic means that it absorbs water easily. All natural fibers are hydrophilic. They all like water. There are also three manufactured fibers that like water. Acetate, rayon, and lyocell. They like water as well because they come from a natural source. So they are manufactured fibers, but they are primarily made out of what we call cellulose. So, <clears throat> again, if you think back to cellulose, cellulose means that it comes from a plant. Plants like water. Plants live off of water. I have a bouquet of flowers sitting in front of me, sitting in a vase with water. And that water will be gone in a couple of days because these natural cellulosic flowers are gonna absorb all that water. So, again, Natural fibers, whether it be cellulosic or protein, which comes from an animal. My dog, he's got his bowl of water right there, loves it. He'll drink it up two bowls a day. Protein needs water. Um, so, And then mineral also, as well, needs water to form. So, natural loves water, hydrophilic. Manufactured doesn't like water or has a difficulty absorbing water or absorbs little water. And so we call that hydrophobic. Phobic as in I'm afraid. So if you're arachnophobic, you don't like spiders. If you're hydrophobic, you don't like water. Um, all manufactured fibers, except for those three, except for acetate, rayon, and lyocell, they're all hydrophobic. They have a difficult time absorbing water, or some of them absorb no water whatsoever. <clears throat> Glass absorbs no water at all. And that's an example of one of those that doesn't absorb. Okay, so hydrophilic versus hydrophobic. Okay, so fiber absorbency affects many different conditions, many different reasons why we would use it and why we wouldn't. Skin comfort. You want to be comfortable wearing something. I like to think of the diaper. Babies are very you know, particular when it comes to the diaper that they like. It's so funny when you have kiddos, you'll learn, oh, my son liked this type of diaper, my daughter liked this type of diaper. Um, and then you, you know, especially being very tired, you want to make sure that you only ever have that diaper on hand. And a yeah, diaper is important. It should absorb and it should absorb <clears throat> very well. And the reason why if a diaper does not absorb well, if it's a, if it's a poorly absorbing diaper, <clears throat> that means, I'm sorry, that the baby is going to be sitting in its own wet moisture. 
not comfortable. That can cause a rash. That can cause irritation. Um, so skin comfort, hydrophilic is better. You want it to absorb the moisture. It's not comfortable to be sitting in your own wetness or to be sitting in rain, water, and be soaking in it. Um, static buildup occurs in hydrophobic fibers because the lack of water means that there's the ability for electricity to build up. There's a charge being built in there. So static becomes a problem. And then with static comes things sticking to you and clinging, and thus pills become a problem. And so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Shrinkage. Hydrophilic shrinks more because water is able to absorb. <clears throat> and what happens is it somewhat changes the shape, so it almost like stretches the the textile out. But then once it once the water dissipates, once the water dries, then it shrinks back up and it tends to shrink more. Stain removal. Hydrophilic is easier. Hydrophilic is easier because if the stain can get in there, so can water and soap. So we can get it out a little bit easier. Water repellency, obviously hydrophobic. Being afraid of water is better for water repellency. Wrinkle recovery. Hydrophobic is also better, which we'll talk about a little bit later on, um, why that's a little bit more helpful. Um, cover. We'll talk about a couple of other things that are related to comfort. Um, covered is the ability to occupy an area. Thick fibers or one with a crimp or a curl, like wool, have better cover. Just meaning that, you know, um, takes up more space, um, warmer naturally. Elasticity, the ability to elongate under tension and then recover. So think about a rubber band. The purpose of a rubber band is the ability to stretch, to be distorted, and then kind of bounce back to its size. After time, yes, rubber bands can snap. But again, um, you know, that's vastly different than if you were just to take a piece of string and make it into a circle and then try to stretch that out and wrap it around your hair. Much more difficult. So elasticity is important. An elastomeric fiber, that's an important word to remember. Highlight that. Elastomeric fibers have the ability to elongate at least 100% and recover. An example of that would be spandex and rubber, like a rubber band. If you take a rubber band that's one inch, you know, in diameter, you can stretch it to be two inches in diameter. Um, you can take a piece of spandex fabric, um, think about Spanx, little tiny, tiny little shorts, and you can fit them over your, you know, entire body. So something that looks like it might be a size zero Spank can essentially be stretched to fit a size 16, so they can stretch quite a bit. That ability to stretch 100% or more is called an elastomeric fiber. Wicking. <clears throat> Wicking is really important to comfort. Wicking is the ability to move or transfer moisture from one section to another. This is great for her exercise apparel. You might be sweaty under your arms, but move that moisture and just kind of distribute it all around that sports bra. And now your, your chest and your shoulders and your back feels cool, but it's not soaked. So that's a great, great, great thing for workout wear. Okay. Now safety. Safety is super important. Safety is uh, just so, so, so important that it's just labeled all over those tags that we have within every single textile that you purchase. So um, tags and labeling, we talked about this in chapter one. There are some really important things that go on those labels. Um, safety information is on there. So if it's not suitable for wear by children, it'll say so. Um, and this is this is for all things. This is not just for apparel. This is for interiors. This will, this is for curtains. This is for um, the fabric that's going to be used to upholster a couch. This is for um, napkins. This is for there's a ton of different <coughs> safety um, you know protocols that go into all textiles because flammability is an example right here. The ability to ignite or burn something that's flammable is easy to ignite or continues to burn. We don't want to use flammable materials on curtains. Why? Because if your curtain is sitting next to a candle and it is easily ignited, it will start on fire and then it will burn until it, there's nothing left to burn. We do not want to use the type of material on anything related to interiors. No curtains, no upholstered materials, no floor coverings, etc. Flame resistance means that there's a high ignition temperature. So it's going to take a, a little tiny candle. It's not going to be hot enough to set that curtain on fire. And it's going to have a really slow burn rate. So even if it did catch off of a very, very, very high temp or high temp, um, it's going to take a slow time. It's going to burn real slowly. It's not going to, poof, it's not going to, you know, just light up. And it's going to have a self-extinguishing 
um, you know, to itself. So that's great that it's it's going to slowly turn itself off. Um, we were trying to make a fire outside a couple days ago, and that firewood just was self-extinguishing. Every time you got a lit, it would just turn itself back off. So, you know, it's good to mess. Flammable fabric can be made flame resistant with applied finishes. We'll talk about finishes more. We talked about those a little bit in chapter one. Um, finishes are essentially chemicals that are added to the very last um, step of uh, textile production. And we can alter, we can make something that is flammable, less flammable or flame resistant by applying chemicals to it. The downside to that is that it's not permanent. So as you wash and wear and utilize those textiles, you are slowly going to be rubbing away the um, flame resistance. Flame proof will not burn, i.e. glass. So although it's waterproof, it's also flame proof. Um, these are not common. Most things have some type of flammability to them. Um, flame proof would be wonderful if we could do that for all textiles, um, but we can't. Um, but if you think about fiberglass, um, that is used because of its flame proof characteristic. Okay, how do we identify textile fibers, um, if we're, you know, if let's say that the label's gone, let's say that, um, gosh, you went to the thrift store and you've got a big chunk of fabric and you want to use it to make a pillow, but you're not sure what it's made out of. So it's not always easy or possible to distinguish one fiber from another simply by looking at it or touching it or smelling it, or tasting it, don't taste them, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but you can do some at-home tests um, and then you could do some laboratory tests to really figure out what they are. We talk about this because you are going to do a burn test at home. Now, when you do this burn test, you have to be very, 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 very careful. Um, we'll talk about it a little bit more on the next slides, but this is going to be one of your assignments. It's going to be, we're going to start it this week and it'll be due next week. Um, so there's burn testing that, that can be done at home. Um, it doesn't need to be done in a laboratory. An acetone test is something that can be done at home. Um, doesn't have to be done in a laboratory. Chlorine bleach test, same, that could actually be done at home. A dry and wet strain, also at home. And then other chemical solubility tests, those typically have to be done in a laboratory because you're going to have to have a different, you know, a bunch of different types of chemicals, and then you're going to need to see how each fiber reacts within those. Um, and then you can get down to, you know, crazy, crazy, crazy chemical tests. Um, you can look at chemical compositions. You could do different reactions. You know, um, it, can get, it can get very, very involved. Um, but, you know, most of these... One, two, three, four of these, five of these um, can be done kind of at home. So the burn test, the burn test we talk about the most in detail because this is the one that you will do. So there's pros. It's quick, it's easy, and it's inexpensive. Um, the bad thing about it is you can only use it to determine fibers by groups. So you guys are going to do burn tests where you're going to take um, specific fibers or specific fabrics from your swatch kit, and you're going to cut a piece off of them. Um, again, this is all very, very detailed in the module. Um, but you're going to take a little slice, a little sliver of quarter inch of the fabric, and you're going to cut it off. You're going to take some tweezers, and you're going to hold that little sliver of fabric. You're going to hold it over a porcelain plate or something that's not flammable. So you're going to hold it over a glass plate, porcelain plate. Don't hold it over Tupperware. Don't hold it over a paper plate. Hold it over something that's not going to melt or catch fire. So you're going to hold... With, with tweezers, you don't hold it with your fingers, you're going to hold the uh, fabric and you're going to take a lighter, not a match, a lighter, and you're going to light the bottom of that strip of fabric and you're going to hold it over the plate. And what you're going to do is you're going to look for smells, you're going to look at it visually and look for a flame color, you're going to look at the smoke color, and you're going to watch it, and you're going to watch how it melts or burns. Um, and you're going to, you're going to do all these things and you're going to jot down all the information that's happening on a little chart, on a little printed out piece of paper that you're going to find in the module in the assignment. You're going to print it out and you're going to answer all the questions that are um, prompted on that chart. Okay. Now it says here, it can only be used to identify fibers by group. Synthetics melt. So man-made fibers come from a, from a chemical source. Again, we watched that, that woman, she took the um, the solid polymers and she poured them into that heating component and they melted and they started to melt out of the spinneret, kind of like wax coming out of holes. Synthetic smelt. But they're definitely made out of different chemicals. Can we tell that at home? No, but we can tell that they're synthetic because they're going to melt. Cellulosics form ash. So 
if you think about a bonfire, you know, we made a fire outside out of wood, which is cellulose. That is 100% cellulose. What happens after you make a fire? You have a bunch of, you know, soot or ash at the bottom of your fire pit or in the bottom of your fireplace. I can't tell what kind of wood that was. I don't know exactly whether it was redwood or oak or birch or whatever it was, but I know that it was some type of wood. It was some type of a cellulose. So when it comes to cellulosic fibers, we, we know you're not exactly sure is it cotton, is it flax, but you'll be able to tell that it is a cellulose. Okay? If fibers of different groups have the same burning properties, they can be hard to distinguish from each other, i.e. cotton and flax. They're both cellulosic. Rayon and lyocell, they're both synthetic. Cotton and flax are both going to have ash or some type of a soot left over. Rayon and lyocell are going to they're going to melt and they're both synthetic. But I won't be able to tell which which they are, which it is, you know. I can't I can't distinguish within those categories. Some fibers can be identified because of a distinct odor, color of the smoke, or type of residue, like nylon or wool. Those ones, although they will, one will melt and then one will um, kind of curl up and burn, um, you'll be able to tell that it's different based off of either the smell or the smoke. Um, but again, very difficult because something like wool, like alpaca or mohair, very similar smell. Okay, I know it's natural, but can I tell what exact type of protein it is? No, not really. Um, fiber finishes can affect the burning behavior. So when you are picking your fibers or your fabrics from your textile swatch kit, um, you might want to be mindful of the color that is on that um, fabric. Um, you might want to, you know, think about, ooh, how, how, you know, how stiff is this, or how, how manufactured is this? Even though let's say it's 100% cotton, how many, how many finishes have been put on this? How many chemicals have been coated on this, and how will that affect the burning? So brushed fibers or fabrics, meaning that they, they've been made softer on the surface. So you could think of something like, um, like fleece. Um, where it's got like that kind of very soft, fluffy appearance, it's been brushed. Um, that increases the burning because now you have all these little tiny particles on the surface versus, you know, just being, you know, flat. Now they've been brushed and they're sticking up. That's easier to catch fire. Think about poofy hair. That would catch on fire real fast versus having your hair brushed really, 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 really fine and having really smooth, silky, flat hair. It's not going to catch as quickly as if your hair was, you know, sticking out and all over the place. Flame retardant finishes reduce the flammability. So maybe you picked a fabric out of the textile swatch kit that has a flame resistance on it. That's going to make it harder to start. It would kind of made out of cotton, but it might be harder to light because of that chemical finish. Fibers can mask odors, or finishes, I'm sorry. Finishes can mask odors. Um, so finishes can cause things to smell different. Finishes are essentially just chemicals. Um, and when you put a you know, natural fiber and you dip it in a bunch of chemicals, it's going to smell different. So it might not smell like it should. Fiber blends are really hard to identify. So when you do your um, burn test at home, I'm going to ask you to use 100% fibers only. Do not use um, blends because that will be really hard to tell. Um, other testing, again, acetone can be done at home. Acetate, acetate is used. Um, our acetate fibers are soluble in acetone, meaning it can disappear, it can you know, um, disintegrate in acetone. But you could take acetone, 100% acetone, and dip different types of fabrics into it and see how they um, react. Um, a chlorine bleach test can be used. You could take chlorine bleach and take different types of fibers and dip it into the solution and see how they react. Silk and wool will turn yellow, and then they'll disintegrate when exposed to chlorine bleach. And this is important when you think about, oh, you know, Certain times we use bleach, um, so maybe you don't want to use bleach on certain types of fabrics or fibers. Um, a dry and wet strength test. Um, a dry test it means essentially that you're just going to pull on the fabric while it's dry, and then you're going to get it wet, and then you're going to pull on it. Um, you can differentiate viscose rayon from cotton and flax because they burn the same, they smell the same, they kind of act the same. Viscose rayon is made from essentially the same material as cotton or flax, that very, very cellulosic base. Um, rayon is significantly weaker when wet. So that would be, again, if you're not sure, take your fabric, stretch it dry. Mm, how well does it hold up? Now get it wet, now stretch it. Sometimes they'll be stronger, sometimes they'll be weaker. Again, these ones are very hard to distinguish between the, the very specific type of fiber, but it can help you get a general category. Cotton and flax are stronger when wet, so that's a great thing about cotton is it's stronger when you get it wet. 
And then chemical solubility tests. This fiber identification can also be made using various chemicals to determine solubility. Again, there's this nice chart in the book, but that is something that has to be done in the lab typically. We don't have access to that um, just at home. Okay, so again, a lot of science. I'm going to scroll up real quickly. Chapter two, full of different um, information of different fiber characteristics. So please, now you're going to continue and you're going to do your study guide questions and you're going to start your burn test. That will be due, it has to, you have two weeks to complete the burn test. So please get to that as quickly as you can. Okay, enjoy chapter two.